That is perfectly free. Don't you worry one bit. We hang right. on. We I'm just amazed that people don't walk out after 15 minutes. You know. Well, that's about when we're going to walk out. So. <laughs> well, if you do, but next week we'll be here the whole time. Oh, don't worry about it. It's all on video anyhow, so it's not like you can't catch up. Get this out of the window. We don't want that for a picture. All right. So, am I cooking? Ah, yes. Well, that will come soon in our class. So, um, it's a not whole situation in our house because my husband's allergies that when we get to Passover, we don't cook all that differently than we normally do because he's still free anyway and has been for years because he has. A form of celiacs. Yeah. So, really, the only person who changes habits is that I no longer eat my meow in the morning. That's, that's a second. Yes, though I'm not sure that, that I. Right. Um, and, and actually, for many years, I've had sort of issues around that phrase anyway. Yes. I don't think that any place is holier than any other place. Next year in a peaceful world, right? Next year in. Yeah, because down there you can't see it. It does, but I want us to ask what do we need? Right? Because we don't sometimes interrogate those phrases that we've been saying for years. What do we say? So, hold on a Oh, John, you're wonderful. And I will get on the other side before I do I don't know. So it looks like that's kind of the far edge you can go. Okay. And right here. over to about right here. That's, okay. your, that's your own this range. Is my space. All right. Let's see how well I do. <laughs> One, two, three. Rose. For me to have anything like that is like instant imprisonment. Because I want to just walk. Wonderful. You know, let's just test it and see. Yep, it works. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. I'm not going to introduce you. I, you know, you don't need it. I don't need it anymore. I, I, you know, I, 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 I know this group by this time. Anybody who doesn't know me should just come up as to work some staff and take a walk. Who are you? And you, and you know some people are always quiet. You know some people are I do. I do. I do. And I will make an announcement about that. I will announce that people need to leave. They need to leave. If they leave within the first three minutes, I'll know. That is time. <laughs> then we've got a problem. But, you know. It's spring. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling the spring. Watching the weather in Ithaca. Every time I see the weather in Concord, to see how things are doing up there. Oh my God! Long rainy winters. In where? Ithaca, where my son is. He's at Cornell. He is indeed. I told him uh, last week he ought to be very, very glad he didn't end up at Chapel Hill because that was his other location, and I will tell you why. Um, are we actually, I don't know if they're streaming us now. Oh, dear. Okay. Let's just say the legislature has plans for us that are going to make all of us quite unhappy. We've got a granddaughter of Colgate, so we've got the same weather. Yeah. Uh, Florida and Texas have offered North Carolina the model. Oh, Actually, I think I can say this because I'm not on campus. I work on four different diversity committees. Every single one of them is likely to go the way of all flesh. Yeah. Along with our offices. Yes. So, um, yeah, it's, it's painful. Um, we start at 9.45 officially, correct? Yes. I have 9.44. Is this clock wrong? Okay. So whoever teaches chemistry or physics in this room 
doesn't have a clock that works? <laughs> yeah, maybe. I I don't know. Okay. Um, or confuse the, the professor. So uh, it, Pam has agreed not to introduce me, for which I'm so grateful. Because if you don't know me, then then call me after the session and say, who are you? <laughs> Yeah, but in the meantime, I think for the most part, I do know all of you, and I also know that, that Sunday mornings are a day when sometimes you have other commitments, and so it has always been the, the situation that some people have to leave early or at some particular time. As long as you don't leave in the first five minutes, I'll know that we're okay. <laughs> if you leave in the first five minutes, then I'm going to go home and call into a corner and cry. <laughs> okay, so we have two more sessions on the nature of the... Uh, Hebrew deity, come on in. And um, among other things, I'm going to sing for you at the end of this particular session because I thought uh, it would be good to, to give you kind of an experience um, that is unusual. And maybe next time I should bring my guitar and sing something like, oh, yeah, happy. Yeah, but that's just going to be liturgy, what I'm going to do. So but we're going to start, though, just with the... The title here, Exploring Divine and Human Longing and Love, right? That's what we're going to do this session. And the final session, I'm going to ask the question, you know, what, what does the God we pray to actually have in common with the God of the Hebrew Bible or even the God of the New Testament, right? Because these are texts that are written with certain kinds of ideas about what divinity is, and sometimes those ideas can be pretty troubling for us, and they can feel disconnecting and confusing. So that's where we'll end up at the end of the third session. But there's going to be, in a way, a little bit of touching on that during this session. Are we ready to go? You feel ready? Okay. So take a deep breath and banish any associations with your chemistry high school class. And move on. So let's start with something we all know. In the beginning, human beings were made in the image of God. B'tselem Elohim is the uh, Hebrew phrase, and that word to the left, selem, is the word that we often translate as image. But sometimes I think it's really good to look at what a word means. And as I have said to you multiple times for now over 10 years, Hebrew is a language where one little root, that there is what we call a root, a shoresh, for all sorts of connected ideas, frequently has multiple meanings that sometimes even seem quite contradictory and confusing, right? So remember the root arom, when the, the serpent is described as arom, as shrewd, Remember, does anybody remember what that root also can mean? It was too far back in history, obviously. It can also mean nude. So is the serpent nude or shrewd? Remember we spoke about. And then through the entire passage of Genesis, when the, even Adam are talking and, they are, and the narrator is speaking about what happens when they eat of the fruit of the tree? Um, most translations say they knew they were naked. They knew they were nude. But you could translate they knew they were shrewd. <laughs> and given that they just ate from the tree of knowledge, right, that could make sense too. So we are dealing with a complicated problem that often a single word will have multiple associations and meanings, and we as readers have to figure out what are we going to do with that meaning and what will it then implicate us with in terms of our understanding of God. So some of the things that this word can be used to mean will seem like quite different than others. It can be the statue of a god. Salem is sometimes referred to as a statue of a god. And remember that I said last week that these statues in the ancient world aren't regarded as statues in the same way we think of them. They, they're understood as kind of housing for actual divinity. So there's real divinity in these items according to the ancient mind. It's not an object of stone. It's a container, a home for God. Okay, 
the Hebrew Bible authors can sometimes refer to Salem as an idol, as what we know of as that, that thing which is purely an object and does not deserve our attention. It can be a replica or a figure. So, you know, almost think in artistic modalities now. It might mean a transitory image, something that comes and comes, or it can be a likeness. So you might ask yourself, well, what does that mean, humanity made in God's image? Which one of these are we? <laughs> right? And a lot of these, these questions become almost theological ones. Are we, in fact, a likeness of God? That's generally how it's translated, right? But could we also be understood as a transitory image? Right? Life is short. We are only here for a blink in comparison to God. There is no comparison, right? So there are things for us to think about. And this word is also used to determine human functions in relationship to God. So human beings can function as a viceroy or as a representative, or this is my favorite, you find this in, in my favorite dictionary, God's witness among the creatures, which is really quite lovely. Though, I would love for us to consider the ways in which non-human animals can be witnesses among the creatures, right? So I, I would like to, to move this beyond its human animal realm into the non human animal realm. I am sure that most of you have had some experience with some kind of non-human animal where you feel that, that sense of the holy being embodied by the creature that you're looking at, right? Uh, for me, that just happens every time I manage to get a monarch caterpillar to, you know, my uh, territory. You all know this has now become an obsession with me. And that in my spare time, the thing that I grow most often is swamp milkweed. So if anybody is interested, I'm starting a new crop this next week. Um, you know, I, I, I love this picture. I just felt like it, it made sense in the day of AI. Right? Um, I could have given you real human uh, faces. But it, there's another way of thinking about this Salem. And because it's also applied in Genesis 5 to Adam's son, a son in his likeness. So one of the things we might want to think about theologically is we're made in God's likeness, our children are made in ours. In what way does this idea of likeness mean transmission? And what does it transmit, right? So those are things we really want to think about when we look, as we will very shortly, at the way in which humans interact with the deity of the Hebrew Bible. So there we are, according to his image and named himself. Now there's another story of how human beings are made and what they are supposed to represent. And here we have an agricultural story. God takes a human being, puts him in the garden that God made, and guess what? The first thing humans get to do is work. <laughs> Weed. Pardon me? Weed. Weed. Yes, for those of you who know how much labor that is, absolutely. That actually is very important, so much so that I had a student some years back, a very creative student, who wrote a final paper on this Genesis story and described Eve and Adam's, um, we might say, rebellion or disobedience. He described that as a peasant revolt. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Right? You know, just, no, we're not going to work here. And what do you get? You get kicked out by the Lord of the manor, and then the work gets even harder, right? But human beings are made to work. So we also want to think about what does that mean in terms of our relationship to the deity? And even when we might want to consider that God works too. God works for six days. And the text, and the, yes, John? I'm just thinking, you know, it says the till and the tendon, but mm -hmm. there was no sense of toil like there is after 
they get kicked out of the garden. The word itzavon, which is uh, the word for toil or trouble, is first used when the deity pronounces judgment on Adam and Eve and tells them what their punishment is going to be. That they are going to have toil. They are going to have trouble. And why? Because the earth will not give to Adam as it did in the garden. It's going to have to require labor, intensive work, for Adam to be able to extract food. And Eve's toil, by the way, this I know I've talked to you about this before, but I'll remind you, is not that she's going to have pain in childbearing. That's a mistranslation. The translation there, ask Kimmel Munners over at Chapel Hill, who's written a book on this topic, the toil that she's going to have is many, many pregnancies. That's actually what the Hebrew means. And given that in the time that these stories were created, you had to have four children to make sure two survive to adulthood. Right? Most children are dying by the age of five. The multiple pregnancies is a kind of a toil on the body right? that she's going to have to undergo. And that is equivalent to his toil in terms of the work. Right, so there's work, but it's lovely work. Right? It's the kind of work that, that involves, for example, for me, walking down to my garden with my clippers and taking the cucumber and the tomatoes and the green peppers and the eggplant and putting them in a basket and going up to the house with them. Right? That kind of joyous, productive, um, happy work. I, I, at least that's how I imagine it's going on here. So on the face of it, I, I forget who it was last week who said we were supposed to love God and be obedient to God. Was were you that person? I can't remember. Somebody said that's that's what we were supposed to do. Somebody said this. And because yes, it was. All right. And on the face of it, indeed, loyalty, devotion, and obedience are what are required of the human creation. I'm going to come back to this piece at the very end of this presentation. Right? This appears to be, you're supposed to till my garden, you're supposed to go and um, be fruitful and multiply, uh, a passage which I think is, is painful given climate change and our current time. You're supposed to rule the creatures in Genesis 1, right? You're in charge. We've done very badly. But all of this is, is intentionally emphasized repeatedly in the Hebrew Bible, that human beings, the Israelites particularly, are meant to follow God's commandments, God's law, God, we call these mitzvot, right, those good deeds that we're supposed to do. This is our obligation, to create a just world. You have to follow these laws. You have to be obedient to the deity. This is actually why, by the way, there is no such thing as magic in the Hebrew Bible. I know you've been told otherwise. No, it doesn't work like that. And I will be happy to talk about that next year, maybe. Because if I talk about it now, it'll, it'll end up being a little bit too long. Um, there is loyalty, but not magic the way we think about it. It's another story. So this is what we see on the face of it. But there are all sorts of subtle moments that should open us to the possibility of looking at a human divine interaction that doesn't seem to be so straightforward. So I spend two weeks in a class called Why God Lies, the Difficult Deity of the Hebrew Bible, talking about the Genesis story in which the deity says, you touch that fruit and you are toast. Right? Now, you have all been told, I am sure, that really God did not mean to say to Adam, you will die the moment that you eat. No, no, no. Um, God's soul is what is, is being spoken about here. Problem being that for the Hebrew Bible writers, there is no such concept. That concept doesn't exist until it's imported from Greek philosophy many centuries later, 
Or you might have been told, oh, look at that lovely Psalms text, right? A day in the life of God is a thousand years, and Adam lived 930 years. So therefore, know when God said, on the day that you eat of it, you die, he meant a thousand years later, right? Which is a very interesting exegetical move made by Jews and Christians to get around that, <laughs> that problem text, right? Because none of us wants to think about God fibbing, right? Or lying. And yet, if you look at this moment where Eve rewrites what God said, we don't know why. We don't know whether Adam told her God's instructions and, and passed them like in a game of telephone rather differently than they actually were. We don't know that she just reinvented what God said. But she says here, it's only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said. She's talking to the serpent. You shall not eat of it or touch it lest you die. Now she adds something. You can't even touch it. God never said anything about that. But she also adds another word. Do you notice any curious word there that might make you think about what she might be saying? It's a little word. Four letters. Lest. So she introduces an uncertainty. You might. We can't do this because you might die. Did God say that? No. The Hebrew is pretty unequivocal. It uses a, a particular grammatical form that is very forceful. In the moment that you eat of it, you will surely die. It's like emphatically stressed. But she introduces this amazing subtlety. And where is God at that time? You know, later on, we hear God walking around to the garden. I've always looked at this as Eve's moment to give God a possible change of mind. Right? He says, we won't, we can't eat of it, we can't touch it lest we die. And if God's overhearing, is God at this moment reconsidering, maybe I set them a weirdly difficult task and it was too much and the punishment was too much and I got to think about it again. It's just a possibility. But of course, nobody dies when they eat the fruit. How does that not happen? Right when God said so unequivocally that they would. So here is this moment where you have this subtle, subtle place where the first character who seemingly questions God's intentions or unpacks a different possibility is a female, which is lovely, right? <laughs> Given so much dominance of the male voice in the Hebrew Bible. And this moment feels to me a lot like Martin Buber. Um, says, behind every prediction of disaster is a concealed alternative, right? The disaster is the potential death, but there's a concealed alternative always waiting in the wings, right? Naomi says, my life is ended when she comes back to Bethlehem. I have nothing. Is it by the end of the Book of Ruth? Not so much. So that is the first possibility. And then, of course, this one, which I know that I've spoken to you about before, Moses imploring the deity saying, don't let your anger blaze forth against your people who you delivered from Egypt. This is called, you know, ego work here, right? You did this great thing with great power and a mighty hand. And now after stroking God's ego very, very cleverly and rhetorically with great skill, then the hammer falls. Let not the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he delivered them only to kill them off in the mountains and annihilate them from the face of the earth, right? Because you don't want to have that reputation. You don't want the Egyptians to say you have that kind of reputation. Do you? Do you? And then the plea. Right? So first you, you frankly butter God up, then you appeal to God's ego in another whole other way about reputation, and then you make the plea, turn from your blazing anger, renounce the plan to punish your people, and then you do the emotional, you yeah, pull on all the heartstrings. Remember your grandmother. <laughs> if she only saw what you were doing now. Right? I mean, it's that kind of moment. Right? There's this beautiful, this is what you promised. You can't go against your promises, right? And so this clever rhetoric is completely successful. It's nowhere near as subtle as Eve, but boy, it works. 
God makes the decision, no, nope, I'm not going to punish them like I thought I would. Right? So here's a second place where a human being's interaction with God clearly is opening up a different possibility, making a change. There is communication between mortal and divine that offers an opportunity for everything to be turned on its head. And of course, this is hardly by any means the only case where we find something like this. I mean, if I ask you, what do you think of when you see the name Abraham in terms of arguing? I just showed you Moses, but I'm sure you can all think of a classic case where Abraham argues with God. The destruction. Yes, of Sodom and Gomorrah. If there are 50 righteous people, would you still destroy this city? No, 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 I won't if they're fair. And what about 45? What about 45? And getting it all the way down, yeah, as far as he can go, right? And that is like it's bargaining for the, again, not anywhere near as subtle as Eve. This is like a real passage of negotiation between mortal and divine. Now, we all know that God sees what happens in Sodom, which is the most egregious attack on his own messengers. And that it demonstrates to him that the, the city is fully evil. Now, personally, I want to ask myself, women and children too, God? Really? You know? Uh, but we do have a deity who, who uh, tends to take out everything that is nearby. Uh, we have only to look at the flood story, right? Collateral damage. Yes, collateral damage. Yeah. Which maybe we want to think about that, that we, we often don't consider the collateral damage that occurs in various acts of divine violence, right? That that's Or human violence. We don't think about that either. When we think about Genesis 34, and the way the brothers go into the city um, where Prince Shechem is, right? The city of Shechem, and and slaughter all the men. But do we remember the passage that says and they take all the booty, right? That means they take the women and the children with them. And what happens to captive women and children in any war? So, right, those are things we need. To, oh my goodness, I came here with a rubber band. I'm sure there was a reason for that. <laughs> They resist. Eve was the first example. But here, how many people know of a passage where Sarah resists? She resists. Laughs. Yes, she laughs. And and not only that, she she kind of questions. Well, she laughs when he tells her she's going to have a child. Right. And she's you know she's like, what are you crazy? And yes, exactly. Well, if you know, faced with, with God, yeah, right? Um, um, and what kind of laughter did she? This was a laughter of disbelief. Was it a la laughter of, of rage? Was it a laughter of dismissal? I think this particular laughter was, this is a hilarious it's idea. But, but her resistance goes actually a little bit farther than, than that. We don't really read this in the Hebrew uh, or we don't read this in the English, but it is in the Hebrew. She, and I know I've shown this to you, she says, oh, come on. <laughs> like, I am so old that I have dried up, literally, is, is the Hebrew there, right? In other words, I don't have the bodily fluids that help you make a child, right? And... How am I going to have Eden? Remember Eden, that the word Eden comes from the word for pleasure? So how, that's a pleasure garden there put in. There you are, John. They may have to work, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> the rabbis think they have fun in that garden. The rabbis think they have so much fun in that garden that that's why Eve ends up talking to the serpent. I've told you that, right? <laughs> they have a lot of fun, and Adam falls asleep. She has no one to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and the serpent goes, oh, okay. It's reopening, right? Um, so, yeah, she says, how am I supposed to have fun, Aiden, with my husband as old as he is? Right? If that is not a Viagra moment, I don't know what is. <laughs> right? 
And so she's like really having a time there. The biblical author is giving her a voice of resistance, of humor, of you've got to be joking, that, that we don't really see the impact of that in our English translations. And we should. Because like Eve, you know, there's a, a kind of a subversive moment going on here. We could, I could have put Naomi up here. Just by saying when she gets to Bethlehem, God has punished me and has taken everything away from me, is kind of an invitation to God, can I have something back of my life? Would you please give me something back of my life? This is a woman who's lost sons and a husband for her. It's everything. So, you know, there's resistance. They plead and they promise. What does Hannah do? Right? She pleads with God for a son, and then she promises, and if I have this child, this child will be yours. It'll be Samuel, right? She only has that child long enough to wean him. And then she does, in fact, give him up to the temple of Shiloh. But Naomi acts. She sees an opportunity. And what she does is pimps out her daughter. She does. The, the, if I actually was thinking about this last week, whether we should consider doing a series on, and John, this was a thought I had for next year, a series on the four feminine books of Bible. And one of them is, is of course, the book of Ruth. And it is a complicated story. She does pimp out Ruth. There is no question about that. And Ruth is the one who bears the brunt of a good many problematic situations in this story. So, yeah, there's that. And I don't think that prevents us from having some compassion and sympathy for a woman yeah, who has lost everything. What you have to do with what, and particularly in the world she lived in. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I'll, I'll quite exonerate her for what she does, right. but I will have compassion for her pain. You know what I'm saying? When you do what you have to do to stay alive. Yes, and it's generally Ruth who is the one who's saving well, those two. True. Yeah. See, we're already getting into next year. <laughs> right. So you know, and of course, David pleading and promising to around the death of his first child with Bathsheba, he doesn't succeed, but uh, he does plead with God to save the child's life. Um, and there's a very curious passage where once the servants tell him that the child is, is dead, he changes his clothes, he gets up, he eats, he goes off almost as if nothing has happened. It's a very challenging passage to try to explain. But nevertheless, the fact of humans knowing, believing, and acting on the idea that there may be a response from divine um, sources, right, from the divine source, is worth our thinking about. They do interact with God. This is not just a, we're not just in receivership here. Um, so the deity can and will change his mind, and the deity is unpredictable. No question about this. Remember I told you last week, I think, that um, I studied in some of my first classes on the Hebrew Bible when I decided that I was moving from 20th century history to <laughs> to Bible, um, that the teacher I had said omniscience and omnipotence is overrated, right? It doesn't really exist in the Hebrew Bible. Um, the deity is neither all-seeing nor all-knowing, and we have multiple cases and examples of that fact. We do have an unpredictable deity, a deity who sometimes does not show up anywhere in the text. If we spent, as we have, I think one year, three weeks looking at the Book of Lamentations, where is God in that book? Never shows up, right? It's, it's just a story of complete <laughs> devastation. It's a story of complete absence of God, except insofar as God is a punishing presence. It's a terrifying book. It is the book that comes out of something like what we saw a few years back, the, the bombing of Syria's uh, Aleppo, right, where we saw a city completely demolished and, forgive me, you know, children in, I don't need to evoke those images for you, right, but, but a city desolated. So because God sometimes disappears, because God is sometimes not present, we have 
texts about God hiding God's self, both in Isaiah and Job, even to the, why are you hiding from me? Why are you treating me as if I were your enemy? These texts, by the way, became some of the most quoted texts in the concentration camps during the Holocaust, because people had to reckon with a world in which God clearly seemed to be utterly absent, right? There, there is no way to figure out where God is when you're watching children being burned alive. Sorry, it's just, those are records at that time. And these kinds of things that are revoking from the Holocaust are with us each day. And, and we do have to ask ourselves, where, where is God, right? And people undergoing that kind of pain and anguish also have to ask, where is God? Because we are all in this room quite privileged, right? We don't have to ask those questions. And because we don't have to ask those questions, we often don't ask them, and we need to. So, that emissary of God, remember, I spoke God becoming, human beings becoming God's emissary. That is one of the most critical pieces of these texts. Human beings as God's emissary, as God's enactors of good, enactors of justice, enactors of, of righteousness, enactors and, and actors who are responsible for creating a just world. Right? There's a reason for the jubilee uh, year, right? In which all debts are remitted, they're done, right? And everybody gets to start more or less afresh. Can you imagine a world like that? I'd love to see what happens to Mr. Bezos when that happens. <laughs> Guess what? You're like right down with the rest of us, right? You know, just the inequities that we live with, that we perpetuate. You know, there's an idea in the Bible that actually has the force of erasing inequities on a regular basis and having everybody start at the same place again, right? Not that we ever did, but you understand what I'm saying, right? And um, so here, right, the stranger residing with us shall be one, like one of your own, one of your own citizens and via hafta, right? You shall love that neighbor, via hafta lo kamocha, right? Which is, you will love like him, like yourself. That's an extraordinary statement. I would like to know how many of us can raise our hands and say, yeah, we're doing that. We love the stranger just as we love ourselves, right? As a nation, we're failing on that level at a grand scale. And we're failing as individuals too, because we're not fighting the resistance to expressing that love that is everywhere in our political world. That is also something for us to think about. In what ways do we function as emissaries of God? And what is our daily obligation in this way, right? It's not just a Sunday morning moment, or at least it doesn't need to be just a Sunday, Monday, or Sunday morning moment. I heard an interesting take on that uh, verse recently with like the youth epidemic of anxiety and depression and like giving everybody else like likes and things and seeing how great other people are, that idea, and then thinking of yourself as nothing, and you would kill yourself when you're not getting enough love or likes or whatever. Um, I'm looking at that verse to say, like, you know, love yourself, in fact, the way that you're out there on the internet, like, loving everything that you're seeing. Like, because that's sort of missing for some of the youth. Uh, I thought that was an interesting take. I hadn't really ever read the verse that way. That is an interesting before. take on that verse. I know, yeah. And we are, in fact, in a world of, of young people's epidemic, really, around self-love that is, I, I can tell you honestly, I'm feeling that kind of thing in my classroom all the time. The insecurity and the emotional fragility of my students has risen exponentially. And we know even that at every nationwide, um, the amount of students who are suffering from emotional um, issues has risen from 15% to 50 at least. That's what's reported. I fill out more student care and concern documents that I can describe, right? So yeah, just 
I hear you, and that's a, a wonderful and interesting way to think about that text. Lovely, thank you. Well, and of course, you know, again, as actors and as witnesses, what are we witnessing to in terms of the message that the deity gives us? I'm sure you've been preached these texts. Surely you have been preached these texts because they are so important even to the message that Jesus sends all the time is based on these kinds of texts, right? Love, truth, and peace. Hate, evil, love, good. Establish justice. And let us not forget that justice is a key element here. It's not just about love. I've spoken to you a lot about love, right? We've had that conversation. But social justice, justice is just as important in the Hebrew Bible as love. In fact, those two things are really kind of intertwined in the sense of how we should be expressing them. So these things are absolutely critical to how we think about how we operate in the world. And our interaction with what God has given us, as I said Friday night in the service I was leading, there's a prayer called Ahavat Olam. And it is, it says, for love of Israel, right? You gave us Torah, Ul Mitzvot, you gave us instruction and you gave us the commandments, right? You gave us the laws and you gave us the statues and these are things, the text goes on to say, that we live in, that must be, you know, day and night, how we are inhabiting the world. People tend to think of the 613 laws in the Hebrew Bible, by the way, about 300 of those, no longer relevant, they have to do with sacrificial stuff, which we don't need anymore, which we in a way, might never have needed because who paid the price of sacrificial ritual in the ancient world? The non-human animals. But in any case, that 300 that remain are, are often <laughs> the kind of thing we are not paying enough attention to, right? About how we should act in the world, whether we are using appropriate weights and measures. How many of you know what you do for a poor person who's pawned their cloak at night, according to Bible? Give it back. Why? Because I need it. Say again? Because I need it. Because it's cold at night. And if you are poor and living on the streets with no protection or in the desert, like look how relevant that issue is when we are living in a world in which homeless human beings are trying to survive on the streets of wintry Chicago, where I was raised, right? And other such locations, or in the burning heat that climate change has now produced for many homeless people to be living in, right? So these are things that are so ancient and so real and so important that thinking of these laws not as this network of burdens, but as this invitation to building a world that will be just and therefore free is something that is worthy of consideration for all of us because we've had our stereotypes about, especially the Jews, right, being, you know, sort of caught up in all of these laws. Well, what was the point of these laws in the Hebrew Bible? To regulate the relationship between God and human beings. That's my favorite quote. That's a favorite quote for a lot of people. I, I fail at this all the time. I fail all the time. But that seems to me the overarching, what is the B'Tselem Elohim that we talked about in the image of God asking me to do? Walk alongside the deity according to these particular critical, important mandates. Right? Isn't that a beautiful quote? That's one that the, there's there's nothing, no dark side of this particular quote. And for somebody who specializes in the dark side of biblical texts, finding something like this is liberating. You just oh yes, I can just immerse myself in this beautiful and precious moment. Love and learn. This is also an important piece in Hebrew Bible of the divine relationship with the human being. It's not just about, again, being in receivership. And the deity also has to learn, also has to figure out who and how and when in his, and I will say his, it is a male deity there, 
you know, reactions to humanity. The deity we pray to, by the way, is hard to get out of that male space, but we'll try that next week. And um, so, yes, you have to seek me. You have to seek me as wisdom. You have to know what the commandments are. You have to delight in them, not be burdened by them, but be freed by them. Every Friday night, Jews light two candles on their Sabbath table. And there's a famous poet, you know, there are a lot of, everybody does like, what do these two candles represent? And then everybody gets like, you know, they're different ideas. Because you know the phrase, two Jews, three opinions, right? <laughs> but the one I gave my, my tiny little community last Friday is that one candle represents freedom and one candle represents love. You cannot have love without freedom. Think about it. You can't. You can't create a space that is happy and safe for another human being that you love without also giving them freedom and space to be themselves. Right? These two things are critical. As we, as my people, are going towards Pesach and the story of liberation, I want them to think about how love and freedom must be joined in all of our efforts. So learning, studying, thinking. I wanted to show you the way that human beings long in this text for God. This is a, a much more real translation of this psalm than the ones you will get, which will tend to be sort of cleaned up and made, as a student of mine says, made to sound like a Bible. God, you are mine. I desperately search for you, my whole being first for you. And my body is faint from desire for you. It's a parched and dry land without water. I gazed upon you in the holy place, looking upon your presence. Your love is better than life itself. Let my lips praise you. I bless you as long as I live. <coughs> I lift up my hands in your name, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I shout for joy. My being pursues you, even as your right hand holds me fast. It's a love poem, isn't it? You know, in a way you could write that to your lover, too. This text also gives us the capacity to think about our relationship with God in the most intimate terms. And we shouldn't shy away from that. What does that mean? To be in this space where you are faint from desire for God's presence in your life and God's feeling of holding you. Right? One of the reasons I make my own kippot, as you all know by this time, is because for me, this, this little thing symbolizes God's hand on my kebi on my head, right? Hold, right? Like keep you safe in that kind of way. And when I make it, I'm always thinking about what does this particular one kind of represent for me? What, what space, what nature, what part of God's creation is represented by what I'm holding, using to hold God's presence on my own body, right? It's a physical enactment of the love. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, now here's a text you all know very, very well. Right? It follows the, the text that is the central text of Judaism. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is a unity. Follows the Shema. So let's read it in English, and then I'm going to sing it for you in Hebrew, and then I'm going to sing it for you in English, but not the way you're reading it. Okay? So, you shall love Yudhevave with your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Take to heart these instructions with which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> This is how it sounds in Hebrew if you go to synagogue in America. 
And you must love Yah with all of your passion, with every breath in your throat and mouth and being with all of your oomph. <laughs> Take these words that I am giving to you and joining you to me into your heart. Pattern your days upon them so that your children and your friends and the people you inhabit this world with will see Torah within you. Make your life into a voice of God both in your stillness and in your movement. Renew these words I'm giving to you each day at night and in the morning with devotion. Bind them on your forehead, in your mind, and on your arm that is guiding for me. Write them as mezuzot on the entrances to your home as a sign that all people will discover me when they enter your home and your life. I recently sang this in another setting, and somebody wrote me afterward and said, can you send me the words? And I said, yes, but they won't be the same as I sang. <laughs> They'll be close. Because I believe that if we really want to understand who we are in relationship to God, the words that come out of our mouth must be words that are present in the moment, even when they are the words of our liturgy. How do we make these words live again? How do we say them as if we are saying them for the first time? Ask John that question. He will have to answer that every time he stands before you and leads any prayer, right? To say the prayer as if it were the first time you were ever saying that prayer is a mandate and a necessity did you see your hand? Yes, ma'am. I, I love what you just said right now. And uh, I just want to uh, reflect back on, on Eve talking to the serpent. Mm -hmm. What if she is doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. What if she's in the moment and feeling what she's feeling yes. and repeating the prayer as she's feeling? Sometimes I also like come to tears in a classroom, right? <laughs> yes, I mean I can I can totally identify with this, right? That she's she's longing, she's saying a prayer, and her prayer is perhaps a prayer that wants to renegotiate the gift of knowledge, and the taking of knowledge, and the acquiring of knowledge with the one who created her. Thank you. And we'll remember that. You have uttering a prayer. Is that the first prayer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that the first prayer that is about an ask? Right? Adam says beforehand, this woman will, you know, this is how it gives the etiology of marriage, which is a different kind of prayer. It's a statement, but this is the first ask prayer. Man, if you give me something to think about. Wow. Okay, some other comments, reactions, or thoughts about, yes, ma'am? Yeah, I was just thinking about that, too. I'm like, 
Um, hopefully because it's my first son's birthday today. And so oh, thinking, that's a tough. Congratulations. He's not a firstborn who like just follows the rules and he's just not that. He always is a questioner and uh, renegotiator. And um, <laughs> I was just thinking like he's sort of like Eve in that way. And Eve gave chance, got a chance to be a more gracious God, right? Mm -hmm. To like give grace and go back on what he said. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that, okay, well, my son is a chance for me to be more gracious and Reevaluate and go back on what I said. Um, what is your name? All the time. <laughs> and what is what is your name and what is your name? So I, I'm calling you by your names. Your name is my name is Paha. Paha. And your name is Haley. Haley. So Haley, I will remember that because I have a 32 and a half year old who has <laughs> <laughs> who has told me what for and how and why and questioned me also since birth. So I'm going to remember yes. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. God bless the children who ask us questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, other thoughts or comments about this whole spaciousness around where we are with, with God and where we need to be with God? Because if nothing else, what I sang to you should have unpacked that while you often hear me come in and talk about what is toxic, what is difficult, what is painful about these texts, Right, and, and I will have to do a little bit of that next week where I say, look, you know, there's this, 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 right? Are you all praying to that God? I don't think so. Spoiler alert, right? But we still have those texts. We still have to contend with those texts. And we have to take seriously texts like this one. What does this mean to take these words and in your stillness and in your movement to live them that takes an incredible consciousness of the now, of the present moment that you are in at all times. And I manage that maybe once a day, if I'm lucky. Because the itzavon, the work and the toil, tend to put me in a place where I'm not connected, right? Yes, Pam. Uh, picking up on what Fahad said, um, I was wondering when we began how we would make sense of the fact that the people were more loving and compassionate and filled with justice than God when they're arguing with God. Mm -hmm. Was part of the intent there in those stories to show that the people, as you sang, had the Torah in their heart? Well, I certainly can hope so. I'm, I'm not, you know, I often talk to my students, if I only had Mr. Peabody's Wayback Machine, yeah. and I could go back and look into the minds of, of the people who composed and, and retold of these stories and then wrote them down and then edited them and all that. Um, yeah, I wish, but I think that all of them, despite their many, many terrible failings, um, and we would have exactly the same measure of feelings because I don't think humanity has changed that much. I think they were also capable of these transcendent moments and imagining that you yourself, right? As, as I also say, one of our liturgical moments, every single service, Jewish service, halachically begins, which means you know when when the the sort of legal requirements of the service. The moment that that begins, and that's not the beginning of the service, the beginning of the service, we do warm up singing and stuff like that, and sing some songs, whatever. But when we get to this moment, the Baruch everybody rises, and we face, basically, you know, out towards Jerusalem, and, or the Ark, where the Ark is located, and we sing Baruch Hu Adonai Hamvorach, which is, blessed is the Holy One, the Blessed One. Mm -hmm. We human beings have the chutzpah, mm -hmm. the absolute courage to say we are entitled to bless God. Mm -hmm. Or in another liturgical moment of Omahu, Romamu Adonai Elohecha, Vehishtachavu, right? So Romamu, we lift God up, and then right after that, Vehishtachavu, and we also prostrate. Right? So we are responsible for lifting God up, for holding God, but we are also responsible for remembering to prostrate. Right? Humility, remember Micah? So do our liturgies and do our texts reflect this interesting collaborative effort between us and what is divine? Absolutely. And 
do those texts seem to suggest that human beings can make God more gracious than God is? Appeal to God's compassion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Pam. Any other thoughts or reactions? Did you talk about what's happening right now? I just turned on CNN at 8 o'clock in the morning, and Netanyahu is saying, we will punish anyone who punishes us. And it's so vivid in my mind, <clears throat> the way he said it and the way it was put on the TV. I, I only watched like two minutes of the whole thing. But it, I don't know how to think of it. In the 1980s, um, when Israeli forces enabled Lebanese soldiers by bypassing and standing aside when two Palestinian camps were overrun and, and there was a mass murder. This happened in the early 1980s. I was on the radio in Missouri talking about this incredible, awful transgression of, of a Jewish... <laughs> ethics. That was in the 1980s. For reasons which are way too complicated to go into now, but which are still obsessing me, we have seen a state move into a mindset, an ideology, and a leadership that is so far even from the 1980s that I hardly know how to respond because I'm one of the rabbis who's been calling for a ceasefire for months. Right, I'm just going to be blunt with you. The peace worker that I heard last fall who said, we either learn to live on this land together or this land will become a graveyard for all of us is in fact, is holding my heart. That, that's an Israeli peace activist. And he said this very soon after October 7th. I won't minimize what happened on October 7th. I will also not minimize the death of tens of thousands of Palestinians, mostly women and children, nor can I minimize what this region has, has now become in its acceptance of senseless, unremitting, awful violence, right? And I don't know that we've done enough to apply what, what we might have applied in the way of influence for the last now six decades in creating peace, right? We haven't done that work. And I wonder now whether it's too late. Hard to talk about, right? But I'm not going to be the rabbi who, who tries to defend a statement like that. I can't. Yeah. Thanks for asking that. Well, let's let's move in kind of a conclusion to a space. Let's let's step out of the Middle East and let's step into the present um, moment, which is right here in this room. Okay. If you take these words seriously, if you really take them seriously, they will transform your life. They will change who you are in relationship to God. Because you will know that you yourselves are capable of building the world that you long for. We used to say, we, somebody mentioned next year in Jerusalem is the first thing that we say at the end of every Seder. I don't really say that anymore. I, I say, next year in the world of peace. That's what I want. Right? So may we all make every effort to create that world of peace and justice and kindness and compassion and love. And I'll see you next week. Well, Barbara, And I'm just hoping I stayed in the in my right zone. You did, I checked. Oh, that was so hard. You know me. Like, Hi over here. Oh, Barbara, that was